very, very happy uh, to welcome to Oslo and to Bilo, Mr. Van Dyke Parks. And your interviewer tonight is uh, the English music writer, uh, Barney Hoskins. Author Barney Hoskins. 20 years ago, uh, I went to Van Dyke's home in the Melrose Hill district of Los Angeles, uh, armed with a fistful of questions about his uh, long and diverse career. Um, I managed to ask only one of those questions, but in the course of uh, the two-hour answer, Van Dyke addressed pretty much everything that I wanted to, to know. Uh, so this time I've... Um, I've uh, saved myself a lot of unnecessary effort and prepared just one question, uh, which I will ask and, and then perhaps I'll just leave. Uh, and uh, that question is as follows. Um, just how did someone as unusual and recondite as you insert himself into something as essentially crass and hucksterish as the American record industry? <laughs> That's, uh, that's very good. Um, Can I go now? No, 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 no. You have to stay here and tell us what that three-syllable word means. <laughs> you of uh, all people. <laughs> uh, no, well, you know, of course, life uh, turns out to be a series of least objectionable choices. And uh, that, I think, is what the record business was when I looked at it. But in the process, as I hung around in my brunette era, I, um, <laughs> I was part of an industry. I was directly under the chairman of the board of Warner Brothers Records. And in being there at a secretarial salary, I learned everything there was to learn about record contracts and the business. It was a, a fantastic time, uh, what we call the 60s, as it extended I did my first record in 63. The pinnacle of, of my record business success was when the record business itself reached its greatest success. In 1971, for example, the record business, the music industry, was second only to the legitimate sale of drugs worldwide in rapidity of cash flow. It was larger than bombs larger than munitions. That's a fantastic fact. That was how healthy the music business was. Since that time, I've seen a slow decline uh, along with the defacement of glaciers and the proper ice to be used for Akavit is, of course, glacial ice. So you'd better hurry on that one. <laughs> But the record business has become something entirely different, and the music business has become something entirely different, and something strange to me. But it has alarmed me, to tell you the truth, to see how uh, Spotify and other organisms of legal chicanery, and piracy itself. YouTube is another aspect where people sit in an audience and take pictures of performances without any concern for the artist, the fidelity of the, of the image, either visual or audio. Uh, it turns out that artists are getting paid fractional cents. Where in 1910 in the United States, we had an author by the name of Mark Twain who saw to it that the composer would receive, or composers would receive five cents of a 10 cent piece of music. The other five cents, the other half went to the publisher. So something has happened to the creators that is very, well, it's life-threatening to the creative force. Somehow or another, artists manage to, to pull their bootstraps up and make something of themselves uh, in spite of these diminishing returns. Fortunately, I'm no stranger to low returns, uh, economic. To me, the joy of music is just in doing it. And so my sympathy and my heart goes out to the, to the new generation where I would like to migrate and, and uh, in, in serving them. And I do that, 
as an arranger, I have managed to migrate. And um, my, my heart goes out to them in, in these times of diminished returns for what is a vital creative effort, and that is the political potency of the song form. And that's what I've spent my life serving. How about that, okay? Yeah.